Hey guys, welcome to the off airport video. So I've been talking about doing this for a while and here it is. If you're interested in off airport flying specifically, uh, I think this video yeah, may help and, and benefit you in some way. Basically, I just want to share things that I've learned over the past however many years uh, that I've been kind of focusing on on this type of flying specifically. Probably have something like I, I don't know, probably getting close to a thousand actual off airport landings, I'm, I'm going to say. So, uh, you know, I've got some experience. Obviously, there's people out there that have more experience than me, hands down. And I, and I actually want to cover some of that right up front. Um, if there's something I hope you guys can take away from this video, it would be to seek out and learn from a variety of sources and a variety of people if possible when it comes to, well, flying in general, but definitely with this type of flying. I'm hoping that this will serve as, as a resource for off airport type of flying, but definitely it's not going to be the resource, okay? Because the way I do things and what I know and the experience I have is worth something, but there's a lot of other good uh, advice and a lot of other good people out there you can learn a lot of things from. For example, Greg Miller, the uh, Big Rocks Long Props guy, uh, he used to make those videos years ago. He's been putting a lot of his stuff up on YouTube, actually just here lately. I'm gonna link that in the description below, him and several others. But he's got some phenomenal stuff. He's a hardcore off-airport guy, uh, lands in some ridiculous spots. And I remember watching him many years ago when I was getting into flying and, and I wasn't even really necessarily that into, you know, backcountry and off airport yet. I was just kind of taking it all in and loving all of it. But I remember watching his stuff and thinking, man, this guy is, this is awesome what he's doing. I've never seen anything like this. Of course, there's some other guys out there. Steve Henry, you know, again, another guy that got me into this kind of flying, watching his stuff years ago. You know, the dead stick takeoff guy, that's what that's how most people know Steve Henry. But he's just done some, some phenomenal off-airport flying over the years. Great resource. I'll link his channel as well. Uh, there's other guys. Uh, my buddy Tom Simcoe actually has a RANS S7 too. Another guy that's been doing a lot of off-airport in Idaho for years and years. Good resource. Showed a lot of cool stuff. There's a bunch of people out there, you guys. There's, there's Backcountry Pilots, the forum. Great forum to check into. There's some good Facebook groups, the Big Tire Pilots group and other Facebook groups, obviously other YouTube channels. And there's a lot of resources is the point I'm trying to make. And I think personally the best thing to do is become a sponge and just try to absorb as much of this stuff as you can and learn from it and then go out and, and apply it and kind of see what works for you. And you'll come up with your own technique that's going to be based around information and things you learn from various sources. We're going to cover some specific topics in this video. Um, some of it's generic and some of it's a little bit more specialized based around the kind of flying I do, the kind of off-airport flying I do. A lot of it's at very high altitude, so that will be one of the topics. The basic topics we're going to kind of break down and cover. First one will be how to read the train. To me, that's probably the most important part of doing off-airport flying, of course, seeing your spot looking for rocks and obstructions and figuring out if it's a you know safe place to land without damaging your airframe. The second one doesn't apply to everybody, but it definitely hits home for me. And so I'm going to share some things with you. And that's high density altitude operations. Some of the less obvious concerns, we're going to cover that. We're going to go a little bit into some uphill and downhill concerns with off airport flying because these are things that you have to deal with. And it comes into play, and I'll show you what I mean later in the video. We're going to get a little bit specific with nose wheel versus tail dragger. I've done quite a bit off airport in both, and I just want to share my thoughts on, you know, on the differences between the two. Uh, I'm going to try to give you guys some, hopefully, some advice. If you're kind, of, some of you guys have probably done a lot of this. Some of you maybe not. And for those that are kind of getting into this type of flying, I want to cover a, a section about how to prepare to do this kind of flying, how to start doing it, how to work up to it, how to not bite off more than you can chew, so to speak. And finally, we'll probably just kind of do a section on just general decision making when it comes to this kind of flying, making good choices about when to abort, um, 
and just various other concerns that go along with the whole big picture of what you're doing and how to try to keep it, you know, as safe as you can while you're out there doing this kind of stuff. All right, so those are the topics we'll cover. Uh, yeah, you know the drill. Let's uh, roll that intro and we'll get started. guys this first section is covering how to read the terrain uh, to pick a spot to land and this is arguably the most important and quite possibly the most challenging part of doing off airport flying being able to find a good spot that's safe to land you know when you're happen to scout it and, and inspect it from the air is definitely really challenging and it's kind of an acquired skill the more you do it the better you get at it and the faster you'll be able to pick a spot and determine if it's safe to land. And it's good, uh, it's, it's good that that is the case because the longer you spend flying low and slow looking for a place to land, in a way you're kind of subjecting yourself to a little bit more risk, you know, in, in the case of some other factor like, uh, you know, you lose the engine or something like that. And there's been times where like in my old plane where I had smaller tires and I'd be very careful I was up on the side of a mountain and I might spend 30, 40 minutes making low passes and looking at a spot. Well, that, that introduces its own uh, potential issues just doing that. So um, the, 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 the better your equipment is, you know, the bigger your tires, good suspension, good gear, how slow it'll fly, all those factors also will help in finding safe places to land because the airplane becomes a lot more forgiving if it touches down slow and you've got big tires to absorb, you know, rocks and bumps. So all those things are helping you, but, but honing in that skill and being able to, uh, you know, look at a spot and know that you can land there is also of course, extremely important. And the way to start that in my opinion is to go out and find somewhere where there's an easy go around. Okay. Somewhere that's kind of forgiving like a field and you want to go into it with the, thought process that, you know, you may drag the wheels, you know, make one pass and look at it, then maybe come back and drag the wheels. But you're, but you're going into it with the mentality of, I'm probably going to end up going around because I'm going to see something I don't like. And that's why you want to start in places where you can do that. It gets trickier when you start going into, you know, one way in and fully committed places that are off airport spots. And, and we'll get into a little bit of that as well. But there's a thing that happens when you get down low to the ground. It's, it's kind of like you've got this critical view of the ground. Uh, I just made that up. That's not actually a thing, but what'll happen is when you get down really close and your wheels are close to touching the ground, all of a sudden everything becomes three dimensional and all the rocks and the lumps and the bumps and the sticks and everything will start to take this three dimensional view where they protrude up above the horizon. You're looking down and you can actually see all those things standing out. It's interesting because, you know, from the air, things look smooth. They look flat. You know, there's a lot of those sayings that you've probably heard before. If it looks smooth, it might be. If it looks rough, it is. Those are exist for a reason and they're all very true. And so this kind of plays into that. You'll be looking at it going, oh, that looks like a good spot. And then all of a sudden, right there above the ground, boom, you see all the, the rocks sticking up and you're going, oh, wait a minute. I don't know if I want to do this. That's why you want to kind of come in with that plan ahead of time. Can I go around here? if I need to and already be kind of thinking about that when you go in there because it may happen. And again, there are spots you'll go into where you know you can't go around and you know you're going to be committed and you're going to have to ride it out no matter what it is. You've already made that decision. You already know that you're committed and that's happened before. And we'll talk about some of that. I'll show you some video examples of some of these things we're, we're talking about here, but this is extremely important, but like everything, you know, the more you practice it, the better you get. All right, so here I am. I'm scouting this this location. This is on a side of a hill. It's pretty steep, a lot steeper than it looks in video. In fact, after I landed, I couldn't even taxi up it. But the point I'm trying to make here is I'm, I'm making these slow passes down this hill, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, oh, this is pretty uh, pretty smooth. doesn't look bad. Again, this is where the rocks jump out at you. But this spot is committed. There is no go-around once you commit. 
and right when I got just above the ground, I could see all the rocks really poking up, and it was a lot worse than I thought. Now, is anything that you know I couldn't handle on the 29s? Obviously not. Uh, rode it out fine, but for 29s, this is kind of a place where I, you know, I don't really want to land on anything rougher than that. I'm not trying to beat up my airframe any worse than I have to to go out and have fun and do this stuff. I want the airplane to last long term. So it, it, point being, it snuck up on me. It was rougher than I thought. So even though I do a lot of this and have a pretty good eye for it, every now and then, you know, you just something kind of jumps out that you didn't see that was there, and you have to have already made that decision. Am I committed because I can't go around, or you know, what am I doing here? And I think those, you know, those decisions are important to make ahead of time. I'm gonna switch gears here slightly. It's still on the topic of landing and picking a place and land, but. Uh, along the lines of technique, here, here's something I want to share with you guys. If you're going into a place that's pretty rocky, um, smaller rocks, loose rocks, things are going to get kicked up. If you have the room, I highly recommend doing a wheel landing. Uh, obviously, if it's a really short spot and you got to get it down as slow and short as possible, you may be, you know, forced to do a three-point. My typical go-to is a three-point. I like landing as slow as I can. A lot of these places I land are very short. This particular spot here is long enough, even though it's at 9,500 feet, uh, it's long enough to that I can do a wheel landing. And believe me, I've done both here, and I've learned the hard way, um, you know, do a wheel landing. And, and the reason is, as you can see here, coming in a three-point, kicking up rocks. You can hear them hitting stuff back there. Luckily, the damage was not too serious, but it could have been a lot worse. You know, after I... Uh, thought about it for a second of course I made some subsequent landings uh, wheel landing and as you can see there is no noise of rocks hitting things on the tail but it just it'll go a long ways to avoid tearing up your tail feathers and uh, beating up your airframe if you have the room so just just a little quick technique thing there I thought I'd share let me show you kind of what I'm talking about when you're at a spot like this the grass conceals things and hides things. That's what makes it tricky. So depending on where the sun is, especially, you're going to get shadows on the lower, you know, sides, you know, towards the base of these clumps of grass. And these rocks really blend in, especially from the air. You can't see this. So there's all these dark rocks here, and they really blend in in the shadows of these bushes. You know, it's really hard to tell the difference, especially when you're doing 50, 60 mile an hour over the top of them. So grass can be scary. You know, the clumpy part of it's a little rough. The airplane will take that fine. These rocks hiding in there can potentially create a problem. The 29s on mine, yeah, they'll probably soak up most of these, but some of them got kind of a sharp edge. You come down and land on some sharp uh, rock like that, it... 50 miles an hour, you know, that's that's hard on stuff, man. I don't want to do that, especially out here in the middle of nowhere. There's another one. It's hiding good. So that's the thing is when you're up high, you know, it's hard to see this stuff. As you come down lower, all of a sudden it starts to pop up. But like in this case, the grass is really going to hide what's going on underneath. Another thing, uh, probably, you know, as far as like best practices go, after you've landed, shut down, um, you know, best thing probably to do is just land, come to a stop, shut down right there on the spot, get out and walk it. Um, I don't always do that, of course, because I can hang my head out the window on this thing and see what's in front of me pretty well. But even after you've taxied and stopped, you won't always want to walk the area you plan on taking off, even if it's the same area you landed because of those things hiding in the grass and whatnot. And sometimes the wind will change while you're at a location. And so you're gonna be taken off in a different spot. So again, stop and walk it, it's worth it. And there's a lot of reasons why I come out and try to land in these spots, but it's amazing the things you'll find just in some random spot that doesn't look like it's really anything that exciting or special. And you come out here and you just find some beautiful little canyon with some cool rock formations, you know. There's just stuff like this all over. That's why being able to access these areas is so awesome. I guess that's why part of why we risk it. We gotta figure out how to minimize those risks as much as possible. We won't be bending up airplanes and getting stranded, you know. So I hope, hopefully some of this stuff helps you guys a little bit.
All right, just to recap this section one, probably the most important part, you know, determining if it's safe to land. Uh, number one thing is just practice. You've got to go out and practice this stuff, practice in a safe place. It's the best way to get better at it. It is an acquired skill. The more you do this, the better of an eye you will get for uh, reading the ground and the terrain and knowing if it's safe to land. So you've got to put in the time. Remember things pop out right at the last second, right before you hit the ground is where you're really going to see what you're about to run into. So know ahead of time if you can go around or not. If you can't go around, be prepared to ride it out. Bigger tires, better landing gear, good shocks, all those things are uh, its insurance to make sure that you'll land successfully and be able to handle things that maybe you didn't see from the air. So can't stress that enough. Uh, big tires, you know, very worth having. Um, slows you down, but lets you get away with this stuff and make a few mistakes and survive it along the way. So good stuff to have. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, welcome to section two, guys. We're going to combine several things into this section. We'll call this section uh, talking about things, being aware of things that maybe aren't super obvious, just some things that I haven't really seen mentioned elsewhere. Um, we'll break this section into a couple of parts. We'll talk about some density altitude concerns, um, some of the less obvious or less talked about density altitude concerns. We'll talk about some things like uphill and downhill landings and some of the issues that go along with those. And we'll cover tailwheel versus nose wheel uh, airplanes for off airport ops. All right, let's talk about density altitude a little bit. Most pilots know density altitude is serious stuff. It has a big effect on engine power and also the performance of your wing and prop and so on and so forth. We're not going to get into all that. I'm going to assume, you know, you guys are familiar with a lot of that stuff. If you haven't gotten up really high and experienced it, uh, it is a very real thing. It makes a very real difference. Your landing rules increase greatly, your takeoff rules increase greatly, so on and so forth. Along with that, though, let's cover a couple other things. Now here's just some basic numbers, 10,000 foot MSL. If it's warm, we're not, not even saying hot, just warm, you know, 70, 70, 75 degrees. If you have a touchdown speed, let's say of 40 miles an hour indicated, um, that can turn into 50 miles an hour of ground speed very quickly. So in this case, that's 25% increase speed that you're touching down uh, just based off the altitude alone. You know, we're talking density altitudes of over 14,000 feet at this altitude are not very, not, not uncommon. And that's with zero wind, okay? So wind is the big factor here. And this is where it kind of complicates things. It, it sort of multiplies. Say you have to land with a tailwind or take off with a tailwind. All of a sudden that ground speed is just going through the roof. So that's where it gets weird. Uh, on that landing, I made it 13,500 feet. And I'll show you a little bit of that footage. I had a lot of wind to deal with, which actually helped me. Uh, actually, both that landing and the one I made recently at 12.3, I had a lot of wind I was able to utilize and land uphill into the wind, which is a big part of what made it possible. But it complicated things on takeoff, because now I'm faced with possibly taking off uphill, which the 13,500 foot uh, takeoff, I did have to take off uphill. And that is, that's asking a lot at these altitudes. But when I was scouting out that spot at 13.5 and I'm coming downhill, I'm flying down and indicating about 50 and my ground speed was up around 90 miles an hour. So that, that really complicates things again on takeoff. Now you're faced with taking off downhill. I, I mean, you, 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 most of us would prefer to take off downhill or it's open out the front, of course. But with a big tailwind like that, your ground speeds are insane. And the part I want to cover is this. What happens to your airframe when you start hitting rocks and bumps and different things at those really high airspeeds? It kind of changes things around a little bit. So, you know, let's say you're traveling, you're traveling this direction. This is your tire here, okay? And uh, this is a rock. Now, when you're going slowly, the tire can absorb this rock and the suspension you know, if you've got shocks or bungees or whatever you got in the gear here, all this stuff, it, it has time to absorb this rock slowly, okay? And it can do that, and it doesn't damage anything. The tire will mush around it, the gear moves, and so on and so forth. 
when you hit this sucker fast, now all this stuff is being asked to react a lot quicker and it can't necessarily do that fast enough. I mean, there is a point in which it can't. There's a point in which the tire, the gear, everything doesn't react quick enough and something has to give and now you could potentially, you know, damage the tire or damage an axle or bend the gear or, you know, hurt something in the airframe, okay? So it's just a concern. It's something to think about. So if you're taking off, you know, down that hill and you're doing 70, 80 miles an hour to get in the air across the ground, doing 70, 80 miles an hour on the ground, uh, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, we're talking off airport, we're talking rough, rocks. I don't really want to hit rocks at 70 miles an hour. In my case, I was able to take off uphill because I had the power to do so, but not a lot of airplanes can do that at that altitude. So you have to go into these spots knowing that ahead of time. If I use the wind to land uphill, let's say, that's great. What happens when I go to take off? Do you have enough power to take off uphill or are you willing to go, you know, however fast downhill and deal with the possible consequences? Again, we're just throwing out scenarios. These are just things to think about. Uh, but density altitude can directly have an effect on beating up your airframe is, is where I'm going with this. Okay, another concern, um, tire pressure. When you land, when you take off, let's say at, okay, I'll use an example. Uh, again, this 13.5. I want to say when I left, I'm at a little under 7,000 feet, and I usually run my tire pressure on my airplane around 4 to 4.5 psi on the 29s, okay? When I leave there and then I landed at 13.5, I actually checked my tire pressure because I, I know this is a thing and I wanted to see how high they were and possibly let a little air out of them. Uh, I, I believe they were over 7, like 7.5 PSI, something like that. Okay, so the pressure went way up. Now my tires are super hard, which is not what I want when I'm landing on rocks and other things. Just something, again, to be aware of. Your pressure will, will go up when you go up high and the atmospheric pressure goes down. You know, essentially these two things kind of compound each other. You've got the high ground speeds and then you've got higher tire pressure and then this problem here where you're hitting stuff can actually be compounded to be worse because of two different factors. Okay, here we go. We're going to talk about some uphill versus downhill stuff. This is pretty obvious, but just thought I'd point it out because it does make a very real difference. I've experienced it firsthand, and I just wanted to touch on it. So bear with me with my very impressive artistic work here. It's very simple. Now, obviously, this is pretty steep uphill, pretty steep downhill, but that's to illustrate the point. If we were to draw a line straight down, okay, gravity. All right, we'll draw one over here. Okay, so as you can see, Pretty obvious when you're landing uphill look how much of the airplane is behind the tires so when you're braking hard you've got a ton of weight on your side all right and there's a little more goes into it to that obviously with where the weight is and how far it has to move and all that stuff but this is just the basic principle to show you look over here now you've got a whole bunch of the airplane that's in front of the tire so when you start to brake, guess what happens? It wants to go over on its nose really easily. All right, pretty straightforward. But even on lesser hills, even if you're landing on hills that are more like this and aren't nearly as steep, I mean, it's still fairly steep, but you get the point. It makes a very real difference. This is just something to keep in mind. And even when it's subtle, you can land on something that's pretty subtle. From the air, you may not be able to tell that it's actually an uphill or downhill but it will effectively increase or decrease your braking distance a little bit. And so when you're looking at a spot, you know, it's something to keep in mind that it's, you know, has a little bit of effect on everything. And if you're cutting it really close, well, you know, it can add, it can be a factor that can, that can cause you some issues. Speaking of landing uh, uphill and downhill, uh, coming into land uphill, you need a touch of extra speed, of course, because you're going to have to flare harder or one way or the other, you're going to have to change direction further in order to match the contour of the hill. But one thing that's always surprised me, it doesn't take as much extra speed as I would have assumed. 
Okay, now don't go out there and try to land on a super steep hill super slow and smash into it and bend up your gear. You need to practice this a little bit. Different airplanes are different. But in my experience, a few mile an hour goes a long way in order to match the contour of the hill. This hill right here is a lot steeper than it looks on video. It's very steep. And I only came in with a few extra mile an hour and floated up it quite a ways. I mean, it wasn't an issue. I knew about where it was going to touch down, and I knew it would stop super quick because I had some wind in my favor and, of course, the hill. But it just always amazes me. You don't need a ton of extra speed. If you're landing uphill, you want to carry a little bit, but don't come barreling in there really hauling, or you'll be surprised how far up that hill you go before you get it down. Okay. Let's talk about tail draggers versus nose wheels. Now, I'm not going to get into all the things about which is cooler. I think tail draggers are cooler. I think they're more fun. I think that you can do more with them. Okay, they have more capability. They're also more challenging to fly. So you deal with more challenge and you get more capability. It's a good trade-off. But we're not here to get into all that. We're here to just simply talk about the differences when landing off airport and why tail draggers are inherently better. I'm not sure I really needed the whiteboard for this part, but I'm standing here and the camera's here. We're just going to go with it. All right, the biggest, the biggest thing about it, okay, obviously on a tail wheel, the tail wheel is your weak link. On a nose wheel, the nose wheel is your weak link. Everybody pretty well knows that already. The big difference is, obviously, on a tail dragger, you can operate without really using your tail wheel basically at all if you need to. When you come in and land, even if you three-point or do a tail-low tail low wheel landing, you can immediately put it up on the mains, either with the brakes or the elevator or a combination of both, and you can decelerate right up until you stop before you drop that tail wheel. Most of my landings, I do that. I'll carry the tail low, and that's because I'm braking, and I'm doing it with brakes, just enough to carry the tail especially if I'm trying to land really short. Obviously, if I don't care about landing short, I'm not going to wear the brakes out any more than I need to. But we're talking about rough spots, short spots. If I'm landing somewhere like that, I'm carrying the tail and I'm setting it down right at the end of the rollout. It is my smallest tire by a long ways. It is the weak link. No reason to use it any more than I have to. Same with taking off. If you have enough power, you can pick the tail up and you can just carry it right out. Okay. Or, you know, you can pick it up pretty quickly after you start rolling out in most airplanes. All right, that gets it off the ground. It's no longer being abused. You don't really have to worry about it too much. Pretty awesome. Okay, so that, that makes tail draggers really good. Um, and then, of course, your mains. You can put humongous tires on your mains, depending on the gear, some types of gear. You don't want to go too big, but you get the point. Now, that's a luxury you don't necessarily have with a nose wheel airplane. On a nose wheel airplane, you got a couple of issues. Number one, it's really hard to get a big nose wheel on most aircraft. On my previous airplane, I built a fork from scratch and I put a 22 inch tall 850 tire on the nose, which is also what I had on the mains. That helped a lot in its capability because all three tires were at the same level. A lot of times what happens with nose draggers is you'll see guys put pretty big main tires on them but the nose wheel is still really small. It, yeah, that helps. It's still better than just having small tires all the way around. But you're kind of limited by your you know, lowest common denominator or whatever you want to call it. If that nose wheel is still small, then it's still going to be your limiting factor. I've seen nose wheel airplanes push in the sand. Literally, they can't turn. The wheel will turn sideways. It's plowing sand. It's not really good for anything. And that's because the wheels are smaller and, and, and you know the mains are floating. They're up on the sand like they should be, but the, the nose wheel is smaller. So it is a limiter, and that's a bummer. Okay. The other issue is, and this is almost more the main one, because obviously in certain cases, some of the Zeniths and like my former Rands and different things, I was able to put a bigger tire on the nose, and that does help. But here's a limiter that it, you just you really can't get around it. Okay, so here's your nose wheel airplane. We've got good sized tires on it. That's all well and good. This is your weak link on virtually all nose draggers. Okay, 
look what happens. You come in and you land, you hit the brakes, and what happens? You start riding those brakes, all right, and the weight transfers forward and down up front. Now, you can have your elevator kicked up trying to help, and that does help. It helps quite a bit, but as you slow down slower, this becomes less effective, and all the weight is pushing down, and you're pounding this nose wheel on rough stuff. So if you've got rocks and junk right up here that you're trying not to run over, you're going to hit all of them, and you're going to hit them with force. Uh, obviously, that is if you're braking hard, but again, we are talking about landing off airport. Generally, these spots are short. Generally, you're trying to stop pretty quickly. This becomes a very real issue, and you're just beating up your nose, and it's backwards from what you'd want, right? So in the tail dragger, you can stop hard and fast and aggressive and, and not beat up your tail at all and put the load on your mains. But in a, in a, tip, in a nose dragger, it's the opposite problem, all right? That's the, that's the biggest issue right there. This also translates into takeoff. It has, it has kind of the same issue. Now, it's not nearly as bad because you can uh, pull the nose off uh, pretty quickly in a lot of tail or a lot of nose wheel airplanes and you can get it off the ground. The problem is there's a disadvantage. So in my old airplane, it was pretty powerful. I could pull the nose almost off, almost instantly. Okay, the problem with that is you pull the nose up to get it off the rough stuff, and quite often you're increasing your angle of attack into the oncoming wind. So the air is coming this way, and now your wing is faced more this way. It becomes more draggy, and you can actually feel this when it happens, and it's going to increase your ground roll when you're trying to take off. It's just not advantageous. Whereas in a tail dragger, you pick up the tail, and now your wings are actually streamlined into the oncoming air, and that's, that's a good thing. That's an advantage. Typically, you can take off shorter doing that. Typically. I did a test video on this a while back. There's a little more to it. The results are not exactly what a person might think. But, point being, it's not a bad deal having your wings streamlined into the air. This is not really an advantage. Okay? And furthermore, there's even some discussion about, you know, when your propeller is pulling you at this direction, okay, versus if the propeller was straight into the wind and pulling you this direction, this is more efficient. So technically speaking, nose wheel airplanes have an advantage that way when they're taking off naturally because they're, they actually are streamlined into the air in their natural state, okay? And the prop is pulling you in the direction you're traveling, which is good. But however, this is an off airport based, what we're talking about here, and it's a little bit different. You kind of lose this advantage when you're trying to pull the nose off to protect the nose gill from hitting rocks and stuff, all right? And if you're wondering about this, I don't have the scientific data to tell you how much difference this makes, but picture this. Picture your propeller was suddenly this way, okay? trying to pull you up, um, and, and, and it's not a helicopter, and you don't have a huge set of blades, and you don't have enough thrust to just pick up the airplane straight up like a helicopter, what would happen in this case? You'd rev it up, it wouldn't move forward at all, so you're never going to take off. So the point is, the further that angle gets up, uh, it becomes less efficient. It's not helping you. So anyway, bottom line is, in off airport operations, assuming rough ground and short spots for landing. Hopefully you can see why tail wheels just plain have the advantage. They really do. Doesn't mean you can't do it in a nose wheel airplane. I did it for years, landed all kinds of crazy places. Thankfully, I was lucky enough to never bend anything or hurt anything, okay, but I could have. And obviously it's more risky to do it in a nose wheel airplane, um, generally speaking. Obviously there are differences between airplanes. There are some nose wheel airplanes that obviously can do off airport better than some tail draggers. But you guys get what I'm saying. All things being equal, this is the better, it is the go-to. But you can have fun in both. You just gotta be more careful over here. And these are some of the reasons why. All right? All right guys, we're gonna wrap up section one here. I apologize for how long this has gotten. Uh, thanks for sitting around and listening to me blab. Hopefully you got something out of this. In the next section, we're going to get into some other things that I think are pretty important, like the general decision-making that goes behind doing this kind of flying. Sometimes you have to ask yourself why we're doing this. Is it worth the risk? Um, 
and you know we get in that mode where we want to complete the task and complete the mission and that's not always the wisest choice so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that uh, something else I would call mental scenario planning stay tuned for that it'll be a little while I haven't even started on it but I wanted to get this one out and see what you guys thought so thanks for hanging out thanks for being a part of the channel patreons thank you for your continued support and you guys know the deal I'll see you on the next one